Hello everyone and welcome to uh, another audiobook. So this is In the Flesh. Um, oh wait, I thought it was Into the Flesh. It's In the Flesh. Um, very nice title. Uh, I must say I really like the title. I'm fond of the title. Um, I have no idea what it's going to be about, but um, it seems pretty interesting title and I can't really wait to read it. So I think we're just going to get straight into it. Um, if you haven't seen uh, the Bunny Cool audiobook that is complete. Um, you can go and see it on my channel. Make sure you subscribe for more audiobooks in the future on all the Fast Bear Fights books. Um, and yeah, let's get straight into this. I'm so excited. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You're so lucky. You just get to sit around and play video games all day. If Matt had a dollar for every time someone had said this to him, he actually could sit around and play video games all day instead of going to the office and working on developing the things. Game development was harder than people thought. It was a great job, the job Matt had always dreamed of back when he was a kid pretending to be sick so he could stay home from school and make simple games on his family's home computer. But there was a huge difference between working on games and playing them. Many parts of the process were exhilarating. That first burst of inspiration when an idea came to you, the triumphant moment when you saw all of your plans come into fruition, fruit, fruitation, <laughs> um, fruit. Oh my God! What is that word? Fruitation, fruit, fruitian. Is it a fruit ion? <laughs> like, but between first inspiration and final fulfillment, there were lots of opportunities for head-banging frustration and punching a fist through the wall rage. One small programming error could mess up a whole game, and backtracking to try to identify such an error was incredibly tedious. People who loved to play games often thought their skills in gaming gave them skills to design games as well, but this wasn't any truer than thinking that since you, that since you knew how to read a good book, you also know how to write one. I feel like Scott is just trying to <laughs> say something to everyone in this story. For now, Matt was eating, sleeping, and breathing for his his job. Uh, he had landed the role of creating and refining the AI in Springtrap's Revenge, a new cutting-edge virtual reality game that was supposed to be the next instalment in the popular Five Nights at Freddy's series. I already loved this story, oh my god. It was the most high-profile high game he had ever worked on, and he knew it was going to be a tremendous hit. How could it not be? With the exciting combination of virtual reality and the established Five Nights at Freddy's characters that gamers already loved to fear. The early glitches of the game had been worked out, and now Matt was about to do what non-gamers assumed the only part of his job was. He was getting to playtest the game. Matt secured the VR headset <laughs> over his eyes and made sure the whole device fit him tightly. He was going in. Oh my god. <laughs> Okay, well, I think I already know what this story is about. This is mad. We're like a few sentences in, honestly, and we already know this is about Jeremy or the playtesters for FNAF VR or something about that. We're going to get some lore about that. This is exciting. This I'm really this is the one story I've been most excited about, like after the first few sentences. This is crazy. There was a wall on either side of him. These walls formed the dark hallway that was the entrance to the maze. At this point, Matt could only see down the hall straight ahead. No entrances to the left or right were visible yet. Just as he was about to move forward, he saw his creation and his adversary. A large green rabbit appear at the end of the hall and then exit to the left. Just because it was a rabbit didn't mean it was cute. Matt had always found humans in rabbit's costumes creepy, as was evidenced by an old picture his mum had taken of him when he was three years old, screaming bloody murder on the lap of a blankly grinning Easter Bunny at the mall. Springtrap, the rabbit in the game, was even scarier than the uncanny valley-dwelling mall Easter Bunny. Its costume was so tattered that some of its mechanical parts were visible beneath the fabric, and the better part of one ear was missing. Its eyes were evil orbs that glowed green when it, spotty, when it spotted its prey, and its grin was wide and ghastly. It was definitely nightmare fuel, which was absolutely what Matt had intended for it to be. Matt was especially proud of this titular character. He wanted to make Springtrap the kind of horrifying character who would endure, who would visit people's nightmares for generations to come. From Dracula to Hannibal Lecter, there was there were a kind of immortality. There was kind of immortality 
in a truly horrifying creation, and somehow a bit of this immortality touched the creator as well. Matt had done an exhaustive amount of research in developing The Murderous Rabbit. He had watched dozens of classic horror movies studying the personalities of their cold-blooded blooded killers. He read books and articles on serial killers about how their appetite for violence could only be sated for a little while until they had to choose another victim. The more Matt watched and read, the more he understood. For the killers who lived on in people's imaginations, murder was a source of joy, a means of his self-expression like painting for the artist or playing an instrument for the musician. Matt wanted Springtrap to, n to show this kind of joy, this kind of deep self-realization in the art of killing. He had wanted to create a character who could open your jugular with, with jugular, your jugular, with the same happy excitement as a kid opening a birthday present. Matt was no murderer, of course. If he were, he wouldn't have had to do so much research. But Matt knew what it was to feel rage, to feel so wronged, so ill-used that he burned with the desire to destroy, to smash, to teach the people who had wronged him a lesson that they would never forget. During the game's development. Springtrap became the place Matt could put all of these feelings, a repository uh, for all of his destructive urges. Springtrap was the child of Matt's rage. The goal at the beginning part of the game sounded simple. Find your way out of the maze before Springtrap can kill you. But the maze was absurdly difficult, made even more so by the first person's pers perspective that the VR uh, necessitates, necessitated. <laughs> Um, Springtrap was both swift and stealthy and was able to appear seemingly from nowhere and kill you before you knew what hit you. Matt made his way to the end of the entrance hallway and decided to turn right since it was the opposite direction he had seen the rabbit choose. He ended up, as he knew he would, in a large square room with four closed doors. Three of these doors led to new passages in the maze. One led to Springtrap and certain death. Because of the way the game was programmed, Matt didn't have any more idea of which door hit Springtrap than any other gamer would. Which door should he choose? After a quick round of eeny meeny miny mo, Matt chose the door that was straight in front of him. He stepped towards it, turned the knob, and pushed the door open. The soundtrack emitted a deafening screech, and then, and then the bunny lunged at him, its arm outstretched, slashing at him with big, shiny knife. The VR made Springtrap's attack feel disturbingly realistic. The knife slashed what felt like dangerously close to his eyes and when Springtrap lifted the knife high and plunged it downward, Matt couldn't help bracing himself as though he were about to experience real physical pain. Then the, sp they, then the perspective shifted to third person so that Matt could see the corpse of his avatar sprawled face down on the floor. Springtrap, showing the twisted joy that Matt had intended, smiled with a look of true bliss. He knelt beside Matt's avatar and used his knife to slice off Matt's ear. Springtrap held up the blood dripping ear, a trophy commemorating his achievement. The words game over appeared on the screen. Matt was furious at himself for choosing the wrong door, furious at his rabbit creation for taking such obvious pleasure in his defeat. He didn't even remove the headset to take a break, he just restarted the game and ran down the hallway until he was in the room with the four doors again. He had a gut instinct that the door on the left was the one to pick. He approached the door, turned the knob, and pulled it open. Springtrap lurched out at him with his jaws open wide. There was the soundtrack screech, followed by a gruesome snapping sound. Matt flinched because it felt for all the world like Springtrap was a, it felt like for all the world like Springtrap was a split second away from biting his face off. Matt's avatar corpse uh, once lay again face down, what was left of his face anyway, in a fresh pool of blood. Springtrap grinned at his victory, his teeth stained red. He slowly licked the blood from his lips. Oh, the words game over filled the screen again. Interesting. Matt cursed, tore off his goggles and threw them down on his desk. He should probably have been more careful with the expensive equipment, but he didn't care. Why did he keep losing to Springtrap? Why couldn't he win a game he had largely designed? He, pl he paced and cursed, then picked up a coffee mug and threw it. The mug smashed into tiny pieces and left a brown splatter on the clean white wall. Good, Matt thought. <laughs> All of his thoughts were destructive. There was a gentle knocking on the door, accompanied by the spoken words, Knock knock! Why do people do that? Wasn't just knocking on the door enough? true. 
Yeah, Matt snapped, not wanting to be bothered. The door cracked and Jamie from the cubicle closet to the office peeked in. She was one of those women who looked like she hadn't changed her hair or clothing style since third grade. Her bangs were cut straight across her forehead and she appeared to be wearing a jumper. I heard noises and wanted to make sure you were okay. I'm fine. At least I was before you interrupted me, Matt snapped. Everybody in the office seemed to love Jamie. They raved about the homemade banana bread she'd leave in the break room and about how she was uh, always willing to help out with a problem, whether professional or personal. But she didn't fool Matt. He knew Jamie was a busybody. It was like she was a vampire who fed on office drama. Sorry, I guess those were just the sounds of the creative process I was hearing, Jamie quipped, crimp crinkling her nose as she smiled. It was a cowering, ingra ingratiating, ingratiating, ingra it was a cowering, ingratiating smile, like a dog wagging its tail when you had caught it peeing on the carpet. That's right, Matt said, not smiling back. What he was supposed to say, that he got mad because the big bunny had ki Oh, sorry, what was he supposed to say? That, the, that he got mad because the big bunny had killed him twice in a row? That he had thrown his coffee mug against the wall because he couldn't handle the fact he was losing his own creation? Matt was starting to feel like the video game developer version of Dr. Frankenstein. Well, good luck. See you later, Jamie said, giving a little wave with just her fingers. You want me to close the door back? I never wanted you to open it in the first place. He was going to go in again. This time, he would make better choices. He would get past the murderer's rabbit. He would lay to rest the nagging suspicion that this game was that this was a game he couldn't win. Sometimes Matt felt like life was a game he couldn't win. Sure, he had all the trappings of a happy existence. He had graduated from a good school and married Hannah, his college sweetheart. He had gotten his dream do job, and he and Hannah had brought a pretty four-bedroom house with an ample room for a ho home office, his massive video game collection, and, Hannah had hoped, a growing family. Back in college, Matt had enjoyed the excitement of pursuing and eventually winning Hannah. He had met her in a killer chemistry class freshman year when she had an A average and he was struggling. He asked her to be his tutor and they met twice a week. They worked on chemistry but they also talked and laughed a lot. Finally he had asked her, will you be willing to go out on a date with somebody who is way worse at chemistry than you? She said yes and they soon were inseparable. Once they were really dating, she didn't even really mind letting him copy down her problem sets. It gave them extra time to spend together doing other more fun things. Their meet cute story was a big hit whenever people asked how they got together. They always said <laughs> They always said we had chemistry. After graduation, Matt had loved going after and getting his dream job, hunting for and acquiring the right house. But once you won the prize, there was nothing to do but maintain it, and maintenance wasn't as interesting. The dream house had extensive plumbing problems, so many that it seemed like they should just ask a plumber to move into one of the extra bedrooms. The job was great sometimes, but there were also countless boring meetings during which people who knew much less than he did talked on and on about insignificant details and he was expected to listen to them respectfully, which wasn't always possible. How could it be when he clearly had the best ideas in the room? And then there was the problem of maintaining a marriage. When they were dating, Matt had been so preoccupied with winning Hannah's love that he never thought about the cost of that price, namely that he was committing to spending the rest of his life with one person and one person only. It had gotten boring quickly. The endless nights in, the same conversation about their days, the same chicken breast and green salad for dinner and the same TV shows afterward. Hannah was still pretty smart, pretty and smart and nice, but the novelty had worn off her. Like when you buy a new car and it's exciting at first but then it just settles into being your car reliable and useful but no longer a source of excitement. There had been other problems as well. Hannah had wanted to start a family right away and Matt hadn't. In fact, the more tedious the day-to-day -day kind of grind of marriage had become, the less he had wanted to add kids to the equation. The whole prospect of parenting yawned beyond him, uh, before him as a string of unpleasant responsibilities stretching out for decades, the feedings and diaper changes and sleepless nights of infancy, the endless ferrying of school-aged children to school and lessons and practices, the drama and rebellion of the teen years. All that plus the stress of having to pay for college. Who needed it? 
Apparently, Hannah had needed it. Or anyway, she had thought she did. Every Friday night when they would go out to the Neapolitan, their favourite Italian restaurant, she would wait until Matt had been softened up by a couple of glasses of wine and say, I think it's time. Matt would always say, time for dessert? Even though he knew good and well that tiramisu wasn't what she was talking about. Time to start a family, she would inevitably say. He had tried to put her off in, ver in a variety of ways. He had said they needed a few years to focus on their careers, but Hannah had said that since she ran her graphic design business from home, she could balance it with parenting now. Once, Matt had suggested that if she wanted something to take care of, they should get a dog instead of having a baby. That tactic hadn't gone over well. The worst, though, when he was when he tried to argue that pregnancy and motherhood would ruin Hannah's petite, attractive figure. That time, she had called him shallow, thrown the contents of her water and glass in his face, and stormed out of the restaurant. The fact that Hannah wasn't willing to listen to, a, to reason about having a baby had definitely put a damper on their marriage. And then there was the matter of the harmless little friendship Matt and had struck up with Brianna, a server at the restaurant where he frequently had lunch. It wasn't anything serious, and it definitely wasn't any of Hannah's business. But she had gotten all upset when Matt had left his computer open and she saw that Brianna had sent him a picture of herself in a bikini. He had no idea why Hannah had been so unreasonable. Friends did that kind of thing all the time. Hannah had suggested that the two of them get marriage counselling, but Matt had refused, and their marriage had ended in divorce shortly after their one year anniversary. Aww. Since then, Matt had had a string of girlfriends, the first one being Brianna from the restaurant. <laughs> Oh god. Oh god. None of these relationships had lasted over three months, and Matt was always the one who got dumped. This string of breakups was a major contributor to the rage Matt was able to summon in creating Springtrap. Fair, fair enough, fair enough. So I think Scott is trying to say here that Springtrap is his, uh, his ex-wife. <laughs> uh, women were crazy. Matt had decided, and not worth the effort. To combat his loneliness and frustration, Matt had thrown himself into the design of the VR game even more obsessively than usual. It was the cruelest of ironies that the game, much like his relationship, seemed to have turned against him, but this time he was going to outsmart the rabbit and get out of the maze alive. Matt ran down the dark hallway and turned right into the room with the doors. He looked around and chose the door behind him. When he turned the knob and opened the door, the entrance was clear. He walked down another dark hallway. There was no sign of Springtrap. He, left, he made a left into the hallway that led into a hall of mirrors. Oh god, we had a mirror maze in the fourth closet, I believe. Uh, he knew his way through, of course. The trick was making sure he wasn't being followed. He moved his way past the pan panel of glasses, each one identical. He was maybe 12 steps from the exit when he felt the presence of something behind him. In a mirror, he saw the reflection of the big green rabbit standing behind him. The rabbit grabbed him by the hair and raised a gleaming knife to Matt's throat. Matt could almost feel the swift, sure slash. Once again, Matt saw his avatar lying face down, this time in a spreading uh, puddle of his own blood. The rabbit licked the blood from the knife's blade and laughed, its shoulders shaking. Oh my god, Springtrap is so ominous in this. But it didn't feel like the rabbit was just laughing at Matt's mortally wounded avatar. It felt like the rabbit was laughing at Matt himself. Sorry to keep pausing, but... <laughs> Springtrap is gruesome in this. <laughs> I love it. I really love where this is going. So the rabbit wanted to play dirty, did it? Matt yanked off its headpiece. He reached out his arms and cleared his desk, sending it all of its contents clattering to the floor. He would show that rabbit who was in charge. He just needed some room to spread out. He was in control of the game, so he was in control of the rabbit. He got to say what it could do and what could not do, where it could and could not go. He would show it who was boss. When Matt went home later, he wouldn't have that much control over his life. But here, inside the game, he was the absolute ruler, and all of the decisions were his to make. He programmed the game such that Springtrap was doomed to wander the maze alone all night, with no victims to stalk and no way out. He also sped up the game's time frame by 1000, so that for each second that passed in real time, 1000 minutes passed for Springtrap. Matt found himself laughing louder and harder at how, uh, than he l had laughed in a long time. Sure, the rabbit might be able to kill his avatar, but that was nothing compared to the way that Matt could alter Springtrap's reality, could control time and space and mete out a uh, cosmic punishment like some kind of ancient vengeful god. <laughs> Matt left the office and laughed some more on the drive home. 
<laughs> this fun this story is actually just hilarious so so far so good um hannah had gotten the house in the divorce so matt had moved into one of those apartment complexes with a pool and tennis courts which advertised itself as offering of offering affordable luxury he had furnished the apartment with simple functional pieces and lots of shelving for his video game collection when his friend jason from college had gotten kicked to the curb by his girlfriend at the same time one of matt's three month relationships had split up Matt had invited him to move into the extra bedroom and split the rent. When Matt walked into the apartment, Jason was sitting on the couch in front of the big screen TV with a video game controller in hand. It wasn't even 6 o'clock and he already changed into his pyjamas. A 2 litre bottle of soda and an open bag of cheese puffs decorated the coffee table. Hey, he said, not looking away from the zombies he was blasting on the screen. Hey, Matt said. And how is spring trap? Jason asked, like, like one might ask about his friend's uh, sick aunt. Matt smiled. Springtrap is going to have an interesting evening. Wait, what? Jason said. Nothing. Matt tossed his bag on the couch. The game is going great. Kids are going to love it. Big kids too, Jason said. I can't wait to play it myself. Hey, what do you want for dinner tonight? Pizza? Thai? Chinese? He nodded towards the stack of takeout menus on the coffee table. Matt shrugged. Whatever, you pick. I'm going to take a quick shower. He had gotten all sweaty and agitated during his battle with the rabbit earlier, but now he could relax and have his revenge at the same time, knowing that the helpless creature was doomed to wander aimlessly through the maze all night. Matt and Jason ate their Thai takeout straight from their containers while sitting on the couch and watching an episode of Rain of Stones Jason had recorded on the DVR. Living with Jason um, felt like being in college all over again. At first it had been fun, no complicated female emotions, no home repairs, no yard to mow. After work, it was all takeout and TV and video games unless someone, unless one of them had a date. But lately the, te the carefree college vibe had started to wear thin and Matt had begun to feel like he was regressing, losing ground at, this, at a time in life when he should be gaining. Plus, Jason had started to get on his nerves. He was so unambitious, working at a dead-end cool centre job and never looking for anything more lucrative or challenging. How could a person be so chill all the time? Before long, Matt was going to have to make some decisions about how to move forward with his life. As the episode of Reign of Stones grew more violent, Matt's thoughts turned to Springtrap in the VR game, wandering endlessly, aimlessly, with nowhere to go and no one to kill. Matt smiled. It served the psychotic bunny right for killing him all those times. It was strange that thinking about the trapped Springtrap made Matt feel a little better. Maybe he couldn't control the people around him, but he was in charge when it came to the game. If he didn't like the way things were going, he just had to do a little bit of programming to change the outcome. That's what I was thinking, like, if you're getting annoyed at Springtrap, just change the code. Uh, the other thing I'd like to point out is, this story is about Matt, uh, as in Matt Pat, uh, and he lives with Jason, who is, who is, who is a, a colleague of, of Matt Pat's, basically. He he works yeah. You guys know I don't know I don't know how to explain it, but you guys know who Jason is. Uh, <laughs> I just find that funny. It's it's it can't be a coincidence, right? It can't be a coincidence. After a mostly sleepless night, Matt was happy to be back at work, where at least things were interesting some of the time. In the break area he helped himself to a cup of coffee he knew he uh he knew would be bad, then made his way to his office to see how Springtrap's night had been. At least Matt knew that there was somebody who had a worse night than his. Matt put on his headset and entered the game. He walked down the dim hallway and turned right to arrive at the room with the doors. He chose the door on the right. Thankfully, Springtrap wasn't there, so he was, gran he was granted access to the rest of the maze. Matt walked around the maze for a long time, but there was no sign of Springtrap. No jump scares, no sneaking up behind him, no quick glimpses of the rabbit at the end of the hall. It was strange. The way the game was programmed, he should have seen Springtrap by now. Matt took off his headset and opened the game's data log. For several in-game days, Springtrap had wandered around the perimeters of the maze, looking for someone to kill. This was what Matt had expected, but he hadn't expected what he saw next. After all those days with no one to kill when killing was his life's only purpose, Springtrap seemed to spawn a new version of himself. Oh! Immediately, the new version killed the old version, and then the current Springtrap would somehow produce a newer version, which would then kill it. The cycle went on and on, creation of a new AI, followed by the newly created one, destroying the creator. 
The killings got ca faster and faster, one right after another, seemingly as soon as the newest Springtrap was able to spawn an even newer model. The murders grew in violence just as they grew in speed, stabbing, slashings, decapitations. When Matt saw the word disembowelment in the data log, he felt the coffee lurch in his stomach. While bizarre, the log didn't at least answer the question of how Springtrap had spent the night. What it didn't answer was where Springtrap was now. The rabbit was programmed into the game's code. He didn't have the ability to truly permanently kill himself. He would always respawn. He had to be in there somewhere. Matt searched the game's VR for Springtrap. He searched part of the game where Springtrap wasn't even programmed to be. After having spawned and killed half a million versions of himself over the course of the night, the rabbit seemed to have disappeared. Except that he couldn't really disappear. It wasn't possible. The code. The answer had to be in the code. I want to say rabbits multiply, don't they? <laughs> they 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 uh <laughs> they have a lot of babies at once. Matt could be absent absent-minded. Sorry, Matt could be absent-minded sometimes. Hannah used to tease him about his endless ability to lose his car keys or his cell phone, but he had an amazing memory when it came to programming. As a result, it was shocking when he looked at the program for Springtrap and saw that it now bore absolutely no resemblance to the program he had created. Springtrap's programming was fractured, splintered, unrecognisable. He had no choice but to remove it and start over. He went through the usual steps to remove it, but the damaged program remained. He figured that, since he was tired, he might have entered something incorrectly. He tried again, but the results were still the same. He tried again and again for an hour, two hours, three, but the results never varied. The damaged program could not be removed. It was as if Springtrap, in one last spectacular suicide, had blown himself to smithereens, and now all those tiny bits of him were scattered throughout the game's code, as impossible to retrieve as individual specks of dust, i.e. A a the, uh, the, the tapes. <laughs> Matt started to sweat, all over the internet and in... Oh. And in every game store, ads for the new Five Nights at Freddy's virtual reality game abounded, announcing a release date that was all too soon. And now the game's program was defective in a way that apparently could not be fixed. Matt's revenge on Springtrap seemed ridiculously small compared to Springtrap's revenge on him. Maybe if he went into the game one more time, he could figure out some way to reverse the damage. No, don't go in. Don't go in. No. <laughs> oh, this is so good. Again, I'm really sorry I keep pausing just to talk, but um, I'm seeing so many correlations here to, uh, to FNAF VR, and hopefully it will tell us some things about it. Uh, this is so exciting. This is my favourite story so far, and I haven't even finished it. Matt's avatar ran around the periphery of the maze, looking for signs of Springtrap. He turned a corner and caught sight of something green up ahead. Springtrap's lifeless body lay around the maze's next bend. It was splayed on its back with its torso split wide open. Matt kneeled for a closer look. Springs and gears protruded from the edge of the gaping wound. How could something so mechanical manage to look so dead? Springtrap's blank, sightless stare was horrible to behold. Matt reached up to the rabbit's eyelids to close them. As soon as he made physical contact, Matt felt a sharp sting, sting um, combined with a mild electrical jolt that reminded him of the pain of his fraternity letters tattooed on his ankle in college. He pulled the avatar's hand away. Matt was too stressed about the, the strange state of the game to be in a mood for a date, but Jason had been insistent. The girl Jason was dating had promised him that her roommate would be perfect for Matt. The four of them were supposed to have dinner together at the Neapolitan, Hannah and Matt's old go-to Italian restaurant. This was another reason Matt didn't want to go, too many memories, both good and bad. But the main reason was that he thought the likelihood of this girl being perfect for him was equivalent to the likelihood of a snowstorm in August. When the doorbell rang, Matt answered to find two young women, one of them blonde and athletically pretty with a sun-kissed expression, c complexion. Maybe this evening would be better than he predicted. Well, hello, Matt said to her, turning on his most charming uh, smile. This is a pleasant surprise. Usually I think Jason is kind of an idiot, but when he said we'd be perfect for each other, he definitely knew what he'd be talking about. He held out his hand. Uh, she isn't the girl he's going out with. <laughs> the pretty blonde didn't take his proffered yeah, here we go, proffered hand and only gave him a small smile back. I'm Megan. Jason's date. This is your date. Eva. 
She gestured toward the brown-haired young woman Matt hadn't even noticed standing beside her. Hi, Eva said, smiling shyly. She was dressed in a striped button-down blouse and khakis, um, like she was going to work instead of on a date. Hi, Matt said, not bothering to hide his disappointment. Eva wasn't ugly, exactly. It was just that standing beside a specimen as fine as Megan, she looked like a sparrow next to a bird of paradise. Matt also noticed that Eva's smile had not benefited from orthodontia. What is that? <laughs> Her parents must have been too poor to pay for braces. Oh, right. Um, Matt had always found that the state of the person's teeth was an accurate indicator of social class. So were shoes. He glanced down at Eva's footwear. Cheap flats. So are we allowed to come in? Megan asked. Of course, Matt said, stepping aside. Hey, Jason! He called, the ladies are here. <laughs> Jason stumbled into the living room, his hair still wet from the shower. He came up to Megan and kissed her cheek, then said, Hey Eva, have you met Matt? Yes, we've met, she said. Matt couldn't figure out why she didn't sound more enthusiastic. She was lucky to be going on his date. A guy liked him. A guy like him would usually be out of her league. And speaking of being out of one's league, how did a schlubby guy like Jason get a shot with a gorgeous girl like Megan? Hey, Jason said. I thought we could take separate cars to the restaurant. That way, if we want to do anything separately after dinner, we're all set. Fine with me, Matt said. Taking his own car would give him the ability to cut the evening short if it proved too unbearable. Matt saw Jason open his car door for Megan. So, he bit the bullet and did the same for Eva. Of course, um, Jason's car was the same one he'd been driving since college, and Matt's was a new sports car. He was surprised that Eva didn't compliment on him on it. On the way to the restaurant, Eva said, So Jason tells me you're a video game developer. That's really cool. Yeah, Matt said, trying not to think about the disappeared code that was endangering his high-profile project. It is really cool. Right now I'm working on the newest Five Nights at Freddy's game, <laughs> the VR one. No, this is not how you pick up ladies. This is not how you pick up ladies. <laughs> uh, I know from experience. It's going great, he said trying to convince himself as <laughs> at least as much as he was trying to convince her. My little brother is dying to get the game as soon as it comes out, Eva said. It's practically all he talks about. He won't believe that I know the developer. Well, now she was showing some enthusiasm at least. Matt decided to lob the ball into her court. So what is it that you do? He wasn't particularly interested, but he told himself to try to listen to her answer. I'm in the IET department at the recreational outfitting company where Megan works, she said. That's one of the reasons Jason thought I, you and I might get along, because we're both into tech stuff. Yeah, well, the last thing I want to talk about once I get home from work is tech stuff, Matt said. Eva's smile looked forced. Yeah, me too. They didn't talk about anything else for the rest of the drive to the restaurant. Matt hadn't been to the Neapolitan since the divorce. It was the same it was always been. Dimly lit and romantic, with violin music playing softly in the background. The elderly... Uh, uh, <laughs> What is that? Maitre de... Uh, looked at him with a glow of recognition. Oh, I remember you, he said. You used to come here all the time with your lovely wife. Well, she's not my lovely wife anymore, Matt grumbled. Why couldn't people mind their own business? The guy blanched, uh, but quickly re <laughs> regained his composure. Oh, I see. Table for four then? He must be like the the waiter. Uh, Matt ordered the Osso Bucco, his favourite. Megan ordered the same, which Matt felt indicated discerning taste. Both Jason and Eva ordered the spaghetti with meat sauce. Matt was appalled by the lack of sophistication. They might as well have ordered from the children's menu. It was then that an idea began to form in Matt's mind. Weren't he and Megan much more compatible than Jason and Megan? After that, Matt and Megan were both attractive, sophisticated people. Jason and Eva, though, they were both nice for what they were worth, but they lacked looks, drive and sophistication. They were spaghetti with meat sauce to Matt's and Megan's osso bucko. <laughs> what if Matt could use this date as an opportunity to charm Megan away from Jason? Megan was clearly more compatible with Matt and maybe that there would be no hard feelings since Jason would have Eva as a consolation prize. Oh my god. Plus maybe getting his love life in order might give Matt the peace he needed to figure out whatever the problem in the game was and fix it once and for all. Here's a top tip Matt. Um, love and relationships is, are not video games. <laughs> like, you gotta, gotta take them seriously, it's not a video game, it's not winning people over, it's it's more just like, going with the flow and, and being yourself. 
uh, not some video game character. Uh, when the waiter came in with their salads, Matt said, I think we'd like to go get a bottle of Pignon Grigo for the table. Very good, sir, the waiter said. Thanks, man, Jason said. Big spender. Matt shrugged. You can't be stingy if you're going to have a good time. It takes money to get good food, good wine, good friends. It doesn't take money to have good friends, Eva said. So what? She was going to pick an argument with him? Well, it does take money to have a good time with your friends. How about that? Matt said. Not really, Eva said, pushing her salad around her plate. Some of the best times I've ever had with my friends have been just hanging out and talking. Yes, but good food and good wine certainly enhance conversation, Matt said. What do you think, Megan? Well, they can, Megan said. But I agree with Eva. Sometimes the best times are just hanging out in your pyjamas, talking all night and e eating peanut butter out of the jar. Matt figured Megan didn't want to make her friend feel bad. When the wine arrived, Matt offered to pour some for Eva, but she put her hand over the glass and said, No thank you, I don't drink. Well, she's no fun, Matt thought. He poured wine for Jason and then poured Megan's e glass extra full. The more she drank, the more charming she would find him. Over dinner, Matt told interesting stories about his life and accomplishments. Sure, he may have felt a little guilty that he didn't let Jason get a word in edgewise, but it was important that Megan get to know the kind of guy he was. Between the entrees and the tiramisu, um, Jason and Eva both excused themselves to go to the ref restroom, leaving Matt at the table alone with Megan. The opportunity couldn't have been more perfect. So, I know you've got this thing going with Jason now because, well, opposites attract, I guess, Matt said smiling at her. The candlelight shines on her golden hair. She really was lovely. But I just want to say that I find you devastatingly attractive and I'd like to give you my number. Just in case you'd like it for, you know, future reference. Megan's blue eyes flashed. I thought you and Jason were best friends. Matt was surprised to hear the anger in her voice. Well, we are, but you know what they say. All's fair in love and war. Just because they say it doesn't mean it's true, Megan said. All evening you've talked about nothing but yourself and how great you supposedly are. Maybe Jason isn't as well dressed as you and doesn't have as an impressive of a job as you. But he's great because he's a nice, caring guy. Matt wasn't going to sit there and take this abuse from yet another delusional woman. Well, I hope you enjoy your life of poverty with your nice, caring guy, he said, getting up from the table. He was so angry, he felt smoke might come out of his ears, as though he were a character in an old cartoon. This evening has been an utter disaster. I trust that you and Jason will be nice enough to give my alleged date, what's her name, a ride. He grabbed the wine bottle and marched out of the restaurant. It was only when he was in the car that he realised he had left without paying his part of the bill. Good, he thought. Let them take care of it. It served them right for not appreciating him. He drove home too fast, thinking of what a wretched day it had been. It felt like the problems with the game had infected his whole life. But that was going to change. Matt woke up, feeling strangely queasy. Usually, morning tummy trouble is a symptom of his having uh, drunk too much the night before. He had polished off that bottle of wine last night, but still, it hadn't added up to more than three glasses worth. He shouldn't be hungover. Coffee, he decided, was the solution, as it was too, as it was too, oh, as sorry, as it was to many of life's problems. He dragged himself into the kitchen and put on a pot to brew. Through the thought of eating, though the thought of eating was unpleasant, he dropped a slice of whole wheat bread into the toaster in case his stomach's emptiness was the cause of his unrest. Once the brewing and toasting were complete, he sat down at the kitchen table. One sip of coffee and one bite of toast later, his stomach roiled violently. Without even having made a conscious decision to move, he found himself leaning over the kitchen sink, retching up not only the toast and coffee, but seemingly everything else he had consumed over the past few days. He rinsed out the sink, wet a paper towel, and used, to, used it to dab his sweaty forehead. His body couldn't have chosen a worse time to get sick. He couldn't miss work. He had to fix the game. He would fix it by lunchtime, he decided. Then he could take the rest of the day off to rest and recover. It was almost noon and Matt's stomach was still roiling like a storm at sea. He had moved to the wastebasket next to his desk so he could hurl into it as needed. Eating lunch was unimaginable. He had been working non-stop to repair the game with no success. He had consulted every manual he owned. He had read extensively from a variety of specialised sites on the internet. 
He had even put in a phone call of to one of his old professors from grad school, but it was all to no avail. Matt wasn't used to feeling stupid or like a failure, but now he was expecting, experiencing both of these unpleasant, unaccustomed feelings. It was like Springtrap, his own creation, had bested him. There was a knock on his office door. Come in, Matt said. He hoped it was either someone to save him or someone to put him out of his misery. Hiya, Matt. It was neither. It was Gary, the head of his department, who was guaranteed in any given situation to A, be of no help whatsoever, and B, deepen his misery. Matt gritted his teeth. Hey, Gary. Matt hoped the signs of his distress weren't visible, but he was pretty sure they were. He was breathing heavily and sweating like he'd just run a marathon. The intensity of his nausea made it difficult to speak. He was afraid that if he opened his mouth, something other than words would come out. Gary sat down in the chair across from Matt's desk. He was, as always, impeccably groomed, his hair in a perfect Ken doll part, his expensive suit wrinkle-free. Have you been on social media the past couple of days? He grinned, flashing his perfectly straight white teeth. Kids are going nuts over this game. Some adults too. It's going to be huge, Matt. Huge. Huge. Matt, e Matt echoed, trying to smile but failing. His mouth refused to grow up at the corners. So, how's it going? Gary asked, leaning forward in his chair. Is, everyone, is everything moving forward like it needs to? Because I tell you, that deadline is looming. Matt didn't need to be told that the deadline was looming. It's going great, he said, hoping he sounded more convincing than he felt. Good to hear, Gary said, like he was trying to decide whether he believed him. Anything I can do, anything I can help you with? No, it's going great, Matt repeated, his voice getting a little high-pitched and whiny the way it did when he was nervous. Excellent, Gary said, getting up from the chair. Can't wait to see what you've put together. You'll be ready to present it on Friday night, right? Friday. You bet, Matt said, gulping. Gary left, closing the door behind him. Matt put his head down on a desk in despair. He had started the morning feeling confident in his ability to solve the problem, but the skies had darkened. Matt took his lunch break, not to eat, but just to get out of the office and try to clear his head. He watched the half block to Gus's, a dimly lit dive bar. Um, oh, sorry, did I say watched? He walked the half block to Gus's a dimly lit dive bar that reminded him of the cheap places he used to frequent in college. Maybe he would just sip on a soda to settle his stomach. Also, Gus's wouldn't be crowded at lunchtime and maybe the, consum the combination of a soda and the dark and the quiet would help him think. Matt placed his order and Gus filled it. Matt wished that all relationships could be that simple. He sipped his cola and thought, okay, so there was no time for a major redesign. Was there anything else he could do that might save the game and save his job? Matt looked around the room. In the corner there were a couple of old video game cabinets that had probably been there since the games were new in the 80s. He stared at the, de at the demo screen of an old maze game, watching a weird yellow ball guy being pursued by candy-coloured ghosts. Then the thought hit him. I can just program in a new spring trap, one that follows the path it's supposed to. The old program is so messed up it won't have any impact on the game anyway. No one will even know it's there. Why hadn't he thought of this before? The problem was as good as solved. He ate a handful of bar peanuts and finished his soda. Something about the combination of saltiness and fizziness soothed his stomach. Then he went back to the office to build a new spring trap, one that followed the path it was supposed to follow. And this time, Matt wouldn't antagonize the rabbit. He had learned his lesson. It hadn't been easy hacking into the company's computer, but Gene had to do it. Maybe it was a sign that things were looking up. Life hadn't been doing great for him lately. He had gotten fired from his job on the nerd team at Good Deal Electronics Store, and had, and had had to move back in with his parents until he could find something else, which hadn't happened yet. It was depressing being a grown man living in your childhood bedroom, looking at all of those trophies from Scholar's, scholars uh, bow. Ball. <laughs> oh my god, I'm so terrible at reading, uh, and math team, and realising how little they meant. That was why he'd been packing on the weight. Depression and mum's home cooking were a dangerous combination, but now he had, he at least had one thing going for him. He had his own early copy of Springtrap's Revenge. Oh no! Because of his superior hacking skills, he was going to be one of the first people, if not the very first person, to play the game. 
and with his superior gaming skills, he might very well become the very first person to beat the game too, and that would be an accomplishment. He put on the VR headset. He was ready to play. Oh no, okay, okay. Gene created an avatar that looked like his ideal self, like he would look again once he got back on his feet. Getting into the computer system and getting this game was a good sign, Gene thought. A success. That would be the first in a series of successes. Once his avatar was created, Gene found himself standing at the end of a dark hallway. He walked to the opposite end. There was a door on the left and a door on the right. Randomly, he chose the one on the right. He found himself in a room with four doors. Clearly, he had to choose which one. Uh, and from his past experience with FNAF games, he knew that the wrong choice would result in a jump scare and a game over screen, of course. He chose the door on the left. He took a deep breath, turned the knob and pulled. It was clear. He, bre he breathed a sigh of relief, took a few steps forward and found himself in another dark hallway. He walked, a he walked forward uh, until he slammed into a wall. He had to say the VR features were impressive. When his avatar hit the wall, he could feel the bump. He felt his way to the right, where there was a passage forward and continued feeling his way along the wall. Between the limited perspective offered by the VR and the lack of light, this maze was obviously no joke, but if there was one area in his life where Gene had full confidence in himself, it was gaming. He was going to find his way out. It was strange. It seemed like part of the fun of negotiating the maze uh, would should be avoiding creepy characters who lurked around corners and jumped out when least expected, but so far there were no cre creepy characters in sight. Not even the title character. The game was called Springtrap's Revenge. So where was Springtrap? Gene Jr. Dinner's ready, a voice called from the kitchen, breaking Gene's immersion in the game. Stuffed peppers and macaroni and cheese. I'll be there in a minute, Ma. Gene yelled back. But he knew it would be longer than a minute. He wasn't leaving the game until he found Springtrap. Besides, if there was one thing he knew about Ma, it was that sh she wasn't going to let him go hungry. If he took too long to come to the table, she'd make him a plate and bring it to his room, so he could shuffle in his dinner while he played. Gene saw something green sticking out from behind a corner of the maze. He went to investigate, stealing himself for a jump scare, but the version of Springtrap he found, while undoubtedly scary, was incapable of jumping out at anyone. Springtrap's body lay motionless and flat on its back, its abdomen flayed open. Springs and gears protruded from the wound. Its eyes were open and empty. Gene thought it might be a trick, that any second the green rabbit would spring to life and grab Gene's avatar ankle. But the rabbit just lay there. Gene made his avatar nudge it with his foot, but it was inert. It seemed to be game over for Springtrap. But that didn't make any sense. If this game was about Springtrap getting revenge, why would the supposed main character be dead in the beginning? unless the plot turned into some kind of ghost story. Gene Jr., your dinner's getting cold. I'll be there in a minute, Ma. Just let me finish filling out this job application, Gene called. He knew if she thought he was applying for a job, she'd stay off his back for a few more minutes. He had to figure out what was going on in Springtrap's revenge, and the only way to do it was to take a look at the code. It was time to put those su superior hacking skills to use again, oh no. After a few commands, he was in. But what he found made no sense. According to the code, Springtrap had been extracted from the very game that bore his name in the title. The program that initiated the extraction was inexplicably called It's a Boy.exe. Huh. Okay. I'm interested. Matt was hungry, ravenous. He was sitting at a table for two at Ye Old Steakhouse. His companion at the table was Madison, who thankfully was as pretty as her pictures with shiny chestnut hair and big doe-like brown eyes. This was their first date, but Matt was having a hard time focusing on the required chit-chat because he was so hungry. He realised he had scooted the bread basket in front of him and had been mindlessly ignoring his way through the rolls. I'm sorry, would you like some bread? he asked, forcing himself to push the basket in her direction. No thanks, she said with an aw awkward grin. I'm watching my carbs. Not me, obviously, Matt said, trying for hu humour as he tore off another chunk of bread with his teeth. What was this? Roll number four? Number five? The server appeared, and before she could even ask them for their order, Matt said, Porterhouse steak. Very rare. 
with a loaded baked potato and cream spinach on the side. And let's get a refill on this bread basket too. And for you, ma'am? The server turned to Madison. Matt figured this was a subtle jab at him, a reminder that he was supposed to have let the lady order first, but he was far too hungry to care about the etiquette. He was so hungry that it felt like a medical emergency. The cob salad, please, with blue cheese dressing on the side, Madison said. Matt hoped the server would hurry back with that new bread basket before he started trying to eat the tablecloth. You know, I've always wondered, he said. You girls always order salads when you're out on dates, like you don't want a guy seeing you eat too much. When do you go out with your girlfriends, do you order something else, like a big plate of ribs or something? Ribs, Matt thought. <laughs> ribs sounds ridiculous. Madison smiled. It depends on how hungry I am. Sometimes when I go out with my best friend, we split a burger and fries. You split a burger and fries? Matt said. That's just like an appetizer or something. Madison giggled. It's really not. Half a cheeseburger is plenty, and girls can't eat like you guys can. If I'd look at a piece of cheesecake, i gain five pounds. Oh my god, same. <laughs> same. Uh, even though I'm a skinny boy. Uh, cheesecake. For dessert, Matt definitely wanted cheesecake. Yep. Yeah. Good choice, good choice. White chocolate cheesecake, raspberries on top, yes. Uh, he rarely ordered dessert, but he was going for it tonight. Stop, he told himself. Stop obsessing over food and notice your date. Well, he f said finally, whatever you're doing, you should keep on doing it because you look fantastic. Thanks, she said, smiling. Good, Matt thought. When in doubt, give a compliment. It always smooths things over. When the food arrived, Matt felt like a starving lumberjack. The rare steak sat in an appetizing pool of blood, and when Matt cut into it, the meat was a purpley red. I think I just heard it moo, Madison said as Matt <laughs> held a dripping chunk of meat to his lips. Well, you won't hear it long because it's going to be in my belly. <laughs> oh god, uh, Matt said. The nearly raw meat was delicious, so intensely so that Matt closed his eyes as he chewed. He ignored the vegetables on his plate and sawed into the meat over and over again, cutting off big chunks that filled his cheeks as he chewed. He resented how the knife and fork slowed down his eating. Really, it would make much more sense just to pick up the meat and rend off chunks with his can canines. <laughs> That's what they're for, weren't they? Table manners, all the rules of etiquette, really, were just ways to delay the body guessing what it needed, and Matt's body needed this meat. He wasn't quite sure when he had picked up the large t-bone from the center of the steak and started gnawing it, growling to himself with animal pleasure. But then he felt Madison's eyes on him. She was sitting across from him, holding a fork full of lettuce in midair, staring at him like he was an exhibit in a zoo. Then he felt the eyes of the other customers at the other tables t as well. He set the, down the bone. I went to the doctor the other day, he lied. He said I was terribly anemic. I must have needed this red meat something fierce. What is happening? What? <laughs> um, you must have, Madison said. She reached into her handbag, pulled out her phone, and looked at it for a second. Oh no, she said. I just got a text from my roommate. My cat is sick. I have to go. She lies. She, she lied. Uh, thanks for dinner. She didn't stick around long enough to hear Matt say, I'll call you. Why couldn't he satisfy this bottomless hunger? His steak was gone now, and so were the baked potato and cream spinach. He reached across the table for the rest of Madison's mostly uneaten salad. It would be a shame for it to go to waste. <laughs> oh god. Why is the story so comedic? <laughs> okay. Uh, as Matt got undressed for his bedtime shower, he caught a glimpse of his reflection in the bathroom mirror and almost didn't recognise himself. His belly was definitely bigger. He was bloated from the enormous dinner he had eaten at the steakhouse, but this seemed like more than the standard post-meal bloat. Matt looked at his handsome face and shrugged. What were a few more pounds? He was still looking good, and historically, being a man with a little extra weight was a sign of prosperity. Matt woke up with a goal that was crystal clear in its simplicity, to make it to the bathroom before it was too late. He threw off the covers and ran, then spewed the remains of his last night huge and expensive dinner into the portion <laughs> Bowl. Oh my god. Ew. He retched and gagged long after there was nothing left to bring up. Strangely, thanks for all that information by the way, Scott. Uh, strangely, he still felt bloated afterward, and his belly was still distended. Was this some kind of weird virus, the symptoms of which were cycles of extreme nausea followed by extreme hunger? If it was a virus, it was certainly hanging on a long time. 
He would have to ask people at work if they had heard of anybody else having the same symptoms. Matt, are you feeling okay? Jamie asked as they sat in the conference room waiting for a meeting to start. Her brow was knitted in a, lo in a look of concern, but Matt doubted that it was genuine. Oh, it's just this bug I'm having a hard time fighting off, Matt said. The smell of the coffee in the room, usually one of his favourite aromas, was nauseating. I'm either nauseated or starving, and I'm bloated and gassy. Do you know about any viruses with those symptoms going around? I don't, Jamie said. And I know about all the bugs because I have kids in school who bring them home, she smiled. Seriously though, maybe you should have a doctor check you out. You're definitely bloated, and your colour doesn't look good. You're kind of yellowish, like you might have jaundice. Maybe you should get some blood work done, and get your liver function checked just to be on the safe side. Oh, doctors don't know anything, Matt said, and neither did Jamie. He didn't even know why he had bothered to ask her anything. Gary walked in, which had the negative effect of starting the meeting, but the positive effect of ending any other conversation. Good morning, Gary said, taking his place at the head of the conference table. Well, the release date is in two weeks, and the reviews from early screening copies of the game are in. And the results are... He looked down at his notes. Mixed. Jamie let out a sigh. According to reviewers, Gary said, the storyline is good, the gameplay is challenging, and the number of jump scares is consistent with what FNAF fans expect. He cleared his throat. However, every single reviewer agreed on one fact. The AI design of, the, the AI design of Springtrap is sloppy and not up to the game's usual standards. Gary didn't call out Matt by name, but he might as well have. With Springtrap's bizarre, bizarre series of regenerations and deaths after Matt had left him to wander the maze, Matt had really needed to rush to create a new AI to plug into the game, but he had been confident that despite the last minute nature of the work, he had still done a good job. Well, good enough anyway. Oh, is that what reviewers are saying? Matt said, his face heated up with anger. Are you going to tell me who those people are, or are they really just you? Hey, hey, Gary said, holding his hands up as if defending himself. No need to get all riled up, I'm just saying that in this competitive climate, nobody can afford to be doing anything but their best work. I always do my best work, Matt said, raising his voice. In fact, I would be doing some of it right now if I weren't wasting my time in this pointless meeting. Jamie reached out to touch Matt's arm, but he jerked it away. I know these meetings take away time that you would use to work and think, Gary said, and I promise this one won't last long. But after the meeting, Matt, as you were working and thinking, I would suggest that one of the things you should t think about is the appropriate way to talk to your supervisor. That really wasn't needed, was it? Let me just have a sip of water. Oh, my throat will go so dry, I can't be able to, s I'm not able to speak. Um, Matt drove home in a rage. He broke the speed limit by double digits and powered through red lights. Let a cop pull me over, he thought. Just let him. Both anger and hunger were gnawing at him, even though he was so bloated and gassy that it felt like a pinprick to his stomach would cause it to pop like a balloon. When he drove by a burger joint, the smell of hot grease lured him to turn in. He went through the drive through and ordered a double bacon cheeseburger, light fries and a chocolate shake. Food that he would generally dismiss as too unhealthy for human consumption, not wanting to have to slow down his eating because he was also driving. He pulled into a parking space and devoured the greasy meat and carbs like a ravenous wolverine. His hunger subsided some. His anger did not. When he got to the apartment, Jason... Oh, sorry. Uh, Jason was packing video games from his shelf into a cardboard box. Other filled boxes were scattered across the floor. What's going on? Matt asked, though he had a feeling he knew. Listen, man, Jason said, not looking up at him. Megan finally told me what you did. She said she almost didn't because we're roommates, but then she decided that I needed to know. She said you hit on her when you were supposed to be getting to know Eva. You gave her your number when you knew she was on a date with me. Not cool, man. Okay, Matt said. If you want me to apologise, I'll apologise. He didn't need. He didn't see the need for an apology, though. He hadn't been trying to forcibly take Megan away from Jason. He had just been presenting her with choices. Jason shook his head. See, that's just it. I don't want you to apologise. I want you to stop being a jerk. But unfortunately, I don't see that ever happening. So I'm moving out. 
You spent our whole meal the other night talking about how pro prosperous and successful you are, right before you left us with the bill. You don't need my help with the rent. You can afford this place without me. I can, Matt said, but I want you to stay. He didn't know why, but he had a sudden desperate need not to be alone. It was a vague but persistent feeling that if he were left alone, something bad would happen. Yeah, and Eva wanted you to be nice to her, but she didn't get that wish either. She's a super nice person, Matt. She deserved better. Yeah, you fixed me up with a girl that, with the great personality, Matt said, laughing bitterly. You kept the pretty one for yourself. Jason threw up his hands. Okay, look, I can't have this conversation right now. I'm leaving. Tonight, I'm borrowing a truck from a buddy. I'll come back in the morning and get my stuff when you're at work. I think it's best if you and I stay out of each other's way for a while. Jason grabbed his keys and was out the door. Matt got a beer from the fridge and sat down on the couch. How had things gotten so bad so fast? He didn't really need to ask. He knew the answer. It was the rabbit. He couldn't explain it, but somehow the rabbit was to blame. The beer tasted sour and unpleasant, and Matt felt the sickly blooming of a headache above his right temple. He reached up to massage his head and felt a hard knob pushing against his scalp. Was it possible he had gotten hit in the head hard enough for a knot to form and didn't remember it? And if he didn't remember it, what did that mean? That he had some kind of brain injury that was causing him to lose his mind? Or maybe it was his physical health, not his mental health he should be worried about. Matt needed someone to talk to about his problems, but there was no one. Hannah had abandoned him, a string of ungrateful girlfriends had abandoned him, and now Jason, his best friend, had abandoned him. As if that weren't all bad enough, he was unappreciated uh, and criticised at work. Perhaps such loneliness was a sad price to pay for his brilliance. Like so many geniuses before him, he was isolated and misunderstood. For the first time in his adult life, Matt found himself crying real tears. Matt couldn't fasten his pants. Today they had been a tight fit, but still a fit. But to oh, sorry, yesterday it was a tight fit, but today they were impossible. Today he had lounged around in his pajama pants all day, but now trying to fit into real pants, it was apparent that his belly had swallowed, uh, had swollen, such that his size 34 waistline was only a fond memory. He tried another, more forgiving pair, and then another, all to no avail. The discarded pants lay strewn on his bed. The problem was that he had a date in a few minutes, of course, and while he did find most rules of etiquette to be stupid and oppressive, he did accept the fact that a public date generally required one to wear pants. He dug through his closet and found a size 36 in the very back. He stepped into them, but they still wouldn't fasten over his belly. Finally, he pulled them down below the mountainous swelling and, um, and managed to zip them back up. The buttons still wouldn't close but he managed to secure them with a belt. It wasn't the ideal situation, but it would have to do. Matt had arranged to meet his new date, another internet acquaintance, in a bar. This way, he reasoned, if the date turned out to be a disastrous as, as disastrous as his last ones, at least he wouldn't have to pay for dinner. The bar was one of those sleek modern places favoured by young urban professionals, all chrome and glass and indirect lighting. Walking in, he caught his reflection in one of the places, many mirrors, and was momentarily startled. His belly was so bloated that the buttons of his shirt were straining, the gaps between the buttons revealing the yellowish skin. His face and hair were drenched in sweat, and was it his imagination, or was his hair also getting thinner? Still, Matt knew he had a lot more going for him than any of the losers in this bar, Emma. That was the new girl's name, right? Emma was lucky to be going out with him. He didn't recognise her at first. She was sitting at a table alone and gave, gave him a little wave. Her face was pretty like he remembered it being on the dating site, and so was her honey blonde hair. But the picture she used on the site must have been taken a good £25 ago. The girl was chunky. It was, a <laughs> it was a good thing he hadn't committed to taking her out to dinner. He probably couldn't afford to feed her. Well, it was too late to slip out now. She had already spotted him. He passed it on a smile and walked it up to the table. Emma, Matt, she smiled broadly and gestured for him to sit down. So, what are we drinking? Hmm, apple teeny? One fruity girl drink coming up. Let me go converse with the barkeep. He went to the bar and ordered the girl drink for Emma and a martini for himself. It was strong, but he had a feeling he was going to need it to get through this date. Yum, thank you, Emma said when he set down the toxic looking green drink in front of her. 
Thanks for picking out this place. It's really cool. I'm ashamed to admit I don't get out much. Most nights after work I just put on my pyjamas and watch Netflix. I need a gallon of ice cream, Matt thought. But he just smiled and nodded. Yeah, sometimes I just end up hanging out with my roommate and playing video games, Matt said. Then he remembered Jason wasn't his roommate anymore. No need to tell her that though. He had already decided he was never going to see her again. Well, you're a video game developer, she said, sipping a cocktail. So when you hang out and play video games, that's like research, right? He managed to st he managed a strained smile. Something was happening in his abdomen. Pressure was building in an unpleasant way, almost like a force was pushing his belly from the inside. He took a sip of his martini, which hit his stomach like battery acid. He must have grimaced because Emma asked, Are you okay? Sure, sure, he said, but he wasn't. But he, he felt like he was going to burst like an overripe berry. He couldn't sit here and make a polite chit chat. But let me just go ahead and tell you right now that this isn't going to work out, so you enjoy your drink and I'm just going to say goodnight. Now wait a second, Emma said. You've barely even talked to me. It's way too soon to figure out whether you think I'm an interesting person or not. So tell me, how do you know this isn't going to work out? Was she going to force him to say it? Apparently she was. Okay, Emma, I'm sure you have a great personality, but when you post a picture of yourself on a dating site, it needs to look like you, not you 25 pounds ago. Emma's mouth dropped open. I can't believe you have the nerve to say that to me. First of all, it's shallow and offensive. But second of all, have you looked in the mirror lately? Feel free. They're everywhere in this place. Your picture online is at least £35 ago. Did I notice that when you came in? Sure. But it didn't bother me. What does bother me is that you're a gigantic hypocrite. Fine. Well, I think the one thing we can mutually agree on is that this date is over. Matt stood up. And when he, he did, he heard an old, an odd, <laughs> not an old, an odd pop 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 sound as though someone were making popcorn. Then he felt a cool breeze over his torso. Looking down, he realised that his bloated belly had caused all the buttons of his shirt to pop off and now he, threw, he was exposed for the general public to see. Emma laughed. She laughed so hard, she snorted. She laughed until her eyes watered. I can't believe it, she said between giggles. This is the best bad date ever. Wait until I tell my girlfriends. Matt tried to clutch his shirt closed and fled the premises. As soon as he hit the sidewalk, the pressure from his belly snapped his belt buckle and he had to hold up his pants with the other hands to keep them from falling down. He, re relinqu he relinquished his grip on his shirt long enough to get into his car. He just needed to get home so this terrible night would be over. Wow. He is terrible at dating. Has Scott ever been on a date before? <laughs> Sorry. Um, back at his apartment, Matt changed into a baggy t-shirt and a pair of elastic waisted pyjama pants. Tomorrow he would have to go shopping for new clothes. But what could he wear while he shopped? Was he going to turn into one of those tacky people who wore pyjamas in public? The pressure in his stomach was getting worse and the weird knot on his head was hurting where it was stretching the skin of his scalp. Maybe he had some medicine that might help him. He went to the kitchen, chewed up a couple of antacid, uh, oh I did say that right, antacid tablets and drank a glass of water. He waited for relief but it didn't come. Instead the pressure increased, even the soft t-shirt he was wearing felt irritating. He took it off and looked down at his watermelon shaped belly. The pressure from inside was pounding, pummeling. He looked at the skin of his belly. There was movement underneath. When he felt the pounding, a faint imprint of an indeterminate shape showed up on his skin. Matt stifled a scream as he realised the truth. Something was inside him and it was trying to get out. The painful pounding became more insistent, a drumbeat of agony. Oh, agony. <laughs> if it was out of him, whether it, whatever it was, the pain would stop. Get it out, get it out, he thought as he squeezed his eyes shut and clenched his jaw. He grabbed and discarded it. His, he grabbed his discarded t-shirt and bit down on the fabric just to have some kind of outlet for the pain. If he got it out, the pain would stop. But how? There was no place for it to go. Another surge of pain hit him, this one crushing. He doubled over and grabbed the kitchen counter for support. His gaze turned to the kitchen knives hanging on a magnetic strip on the wall. He could cut it out. Cutting would relieve the pressure and get whatever was out. He would be free of what un whatever this burden was. He wanted to be free. 
Oh no. Oh god, okay. This is going in a weird direction. He grabbed the largest, sharpest ni kitchen knife and lay on his back on the floor. Starting the incision was the hardest part, but the pain inside him was greater than any pain he could cause himself. Oh my god, I feel faint just thinking about this. Uh, he sank the knife's tip into the top of his abdomen and then drew the blade downward, biting down on the t-shirt so the neighbours wouldn't hear him scream. There was pain, but there was also relief. The pressure stopped, the blood flowed, and Matt saw, emerging from the incision, one long green rabbit ear. What? What is going on? Excuse me? <laughs> okay, that, that came out of nowhere. This is weird. This is so weird. What? I, I mean, I'm going to continue reading in a second, but let me just firstly have a sip of water. And also, um, this is a weird... Like, I did not expect this. I did not expect this. Okay. Well. <laughs> right. Uh, the whole rabbit... Uh, yeah, I am there. The whole rabbit emerged wet and slimy with mucus, a perfectly formed spring trap the size of a healthy newborn infant. But unlike a newborn infant, the rabbit could pull itself out of the incision, land in a kneeling position on the kitchen floor and then rise to stand. The blood loss was making Matt fade in and out of consciousness, but even in his adult state, he could see that the creature had just spawned, he had spawned, with spring trap, but somehow not spring trap. This one was realer, more organic than the one in the video game. Matt's mind drifted back to a story his mum had read to him when he was little about a stuffed toy rabbit that he had wished so hard to be real that it became real. The spring trap that stood over Matt's bleeding body was not an amalgamation of code that somebody like him had programmed into a computer. The spring trap was real. The green rabbit sat down on the floor beside Matt and rested Matt's head in its flurry lap. In its <laughs> flurry? In its furry lap. It felt nice. Matt was losing so much blood. Could a person lose this much blood and still stay alive? The rabbit stroked Matt's cheek. <laughs> oh my god! Matt didn't know if he heard the word come out of the rabbit's mouth or if it was only in his own head. Daddy. Oh my god! <laughs> oh. This story is the funniest, one of the best, and also the worst. <laughs> oh my god, what is happening? I felt faint from the, the incision part, that was gruesome, I imagined it. It's so well explained, but I, I felt so faint from it. Um, yeah, that that is, wow. <laughs> This t is taking an unexpected turn. What is going on? So you entered this apartment and you found him like this? The police officer was taking notes as they take talked in the blood-drenched kitchen. Yes, officer. Jason was shaking. And he could feel his heart thudding in his chest. I was moving out of the apartment and I came here about 10 o'clock to get my stuff. 10 a.m.? The officer asked. Yes, sir. I thought Matt would be at work, but instead I found him. Here. He heard the sob in his voice. He was trying to hold it together, but he wasn't succeeding. So you were roommates. <laughs> oh, so they were roommates. Uh, <laughs> tell me if you know that meme in the comments. Uh, but, you <laughs> but you were moving out of the apartment, the officer said. Had you had a disagreement? Yeah, kind of, but just a little one. Nothing that would lead me to do something like this. And I mean, I'm not a violent person. I could never do something like this anyway. Jason wished somebody would cover up the body. But even when they did, he knew he couldn't unsee it. Matt was gutted like a fish, his shirtless torso a gaping hole. Blood had gushed from the sides of the wound and now formed a large con congealing puddle on the kitchen floor. The now bloody kitchen knife uh, Jason had used countless times to chop vegetables was in Matt's lifeless hand. Did your roommate have any enemies? Anyone who would wish him ill? The officer asked. Well, I mean, Matt was a prickly guy, not always the easiest person to get along with. But that because... But just because he could be annoying doesn't mean that anybody wanted him dead. 
The officer nodded. Had he shown any signs of depression or suicidal thoughts? I think he was kind of depressed. Yeah, Jason said. He'd had a nasty divorce and breakups from a few rebound relationships after that. I also got the feeling there was a lot of stress at work. Though he wasn't the kind of person who'd talk about that thing kind of thing much. Jason looked down at his friend's body. It was the last thing he wanted to see, so why did he keep looking at it? Why would someone do this to themselves? The officer looked up from his notes. Well son, in my line of work, you never stop being surprised about what people are capable of. He looked down at the body, then squinted as if he was seeing something he hadn't noticed before. He put on a plastic glove, then squatted on the floor, reaching for something. It was a clump of something green and fuzzy, like the artificial fur from a stuffed animal. Do you have any idea what this could be? The officer asked. Jason looked at the unfamiliar green fur. It was covered in an unpleasant slime, like a clear mucus. I have no idea, Jason said. The officer rolled slimy hairs between his finger and thumb, looking at them with apparent confusion, then shrugged and wiped his hands on a clean paper towel. Is that it? Is that actually it? Oh my gosh! Okay, firstly, for people... For people watching part 3 of this, you have about a 4 minute video. Because <laughs> um, I didn't realise it would end um, quickly after I ended part 2. So I'm sorry about that, but um, makes it easier to upload for me. Um, for people watching the full thing... What? <laughs> I hate this. What does any of this mean? What does this have to do with the Five Nights at Freddy's universe? I don't know. Um, it was very, very gruesome. I did not realise it would end so abruptly either. I, I knew there were lots of things going on at once. Um, I at least thought he'd go into the game again or he'd get possessed or something by by the VR headset or something. There was also the, the hacker. Because the hacker didn't really do much. Uh, I thought we'd see him again, but uh, maybe not. I don't know. I, I honestly don't know what this story is is doing. <laughs> For the uh, for the universe, but if you do have any theories or any ideas on what this means, um, please do tell me because this is one of the first times we've seen. I mean, technically, Springtrap is a person inside of a suit, so this is a a person inside of a suit in inside of a person, which is a very scary thought. <laughs> but uh, anyway, yeah, if you have any theories, um, then please do comment them down below. I would love to read them. I read every single one. Make sure you subscribe so that you can see the next story. And the next story we are doing is the last story in this book, which is the man in room something. It's like 1780 or something. <laughs> um, but yeah, please subscribe so that you can see that. Uh, and yeah, thank you so much for watching. And I will see you later.